we're going to resume what is session one of this workshop on stability theory and uh, magnitude hydrodynamics for uh, liquid metal batteries. And the next talk is going to be by Peter Davidson from Cambridge, who is going to talk about the transition to turbulence in liquid metal batteries. Probably. Okay, so thank you very much, Orbo. Um, is this okay at the back? You can hear okay? Yeah, fantastic. So I feel at a positive disadvantage after Don's talk and also Frank's both wonderful talks. Thank you very much. So um, you might feel the temperature lowering a little bit. I hope not, but anyway, let's see. So the motivation is this, and, and Don sort of alluded to this a little bit, that the actual batteries we have now, or we have, they have, are sort of fairly small. And if you want to get reasonable power density, you have to cluster them in batches, maybe 200, 300 in a cluster, something like that. So here's one battery about this size. Here's a cluster or a schematic of a cluster. So as soon as you cluster, you've got all these electrical connections between the, the batteries, and they create some magnetic field. There's also a current passing through each battery that creates a magnetic field. So each battery, each individual battery, feels the magnetic field of all its surroundings, and the batteries can start to talk to each other. And Frank just showed you that tiny, tiny BZs can produce a dramatic effect on the flow of a liquid metal pool, and that's going to be kind of the theme of this talk, revisiting what Frank was alluding to. So this is a jump I'm going to look at. I'll come back to this in a minute. But essentially, the key thing is that I'm going to look at the effect of an external magnetic field driven by the other batteries or the electrical connections on the flow in the liquid metal layer in a, in a single battery. The most dangerous, dangerous is an emotive word, but I'll use it. The most dangerous external field is a vertical one, BZ, because it interacts with the radially spreading current to produce an azimuthal motion, and it's kind of like a self-lubricating system with very little friction, and you can build up large amounts of swirl for fairly modest background magnetic fields. So take your messages, we, well the first one is we've got a very simple analytical model for the kind of motion you get when the flow is laminar. If you get lucky, it works also when the flow is laminar and unsteady, and also weakly turbulent. Um, and it agrees reasonably well with numerical simulations. I'll show that in a moment. And what we find is that amazingly small magnetic fields can make the laminar flow grow unstable. So a magnetic field of half a gas, that's about the Earth's magnetic field on the surface of the Earth, half a gas can destabilize the laminar flow. So a tiny, tiny field. One gas already, it's gone turbulent, weakly turbulent. One and a half gas is broadband turbulence, it's fully turbulent. And these are tiny, tiny fields. So each battery here in this cluster might have 100 amps passing through it, and we're connecting them all together somehow. And each connection is creating a magnetic field, and it's hard to believe that you'll get much, much in excess of 2, 3, 4, 5, 10 gas. So the question then is, what does that do to the motion in a single battery? Because some motion is good because you want mixing, but too much is, is problematic. Okay, so that's the, that's the plan. Just to sort of orientate things a little bit, um, you got some hint from Don that the design has changed, and also from Milbert's question at the end of Don's talk, the design's changed a bit over the time. Early batteries were sort of essentially three layers, say lithium at the top, electrolyte between, say bismuth or something underneath, so a three-layer system, two interfaces. Um, more recent designs have gone back to what I think is actually an rather old idea, which is you immobilize the top liquid metal, lithium in this case, with a um, stainless steel, or I think you said nickel foam. And now you've gone from a three layer system to a two layer system. So here's the electrolyte, and here's the bismuth. And I can't remember whether they call it a cathode or an anode now. Neither, I suspect. Okay, so we're going to focus on the second design. Um, so this is our sort of model of a battery, a cartoon of a battery. It doesn't get really look like this. So the current's coming in the top through a stub, and I think you were talking a lot about the practicalities of this seal. It's passing through the immobilized lithium. It's passing through a thin layer of electrolyte, and it's going vertically down through that thin layer. The layer is thin, and the current's going vertically because the electrolyte has a very, very poor electrical conductivity, and it completely dominates the resistance in the battery. Liquid metals are good conductors. Electrolytes are terrible. So most of the voltage drop in the battery is across this very thin electrolyte layer. And of course, the current just wants to take the path of least resistance, which is just straight through, vertically down. The current then spreads out, comes back out, and it's this radial spreading of the current that will interact with BZ to produce this swirling motion. 
This has to be by design extremely thin. Most of the dissipation in the cell is in that electrolyte layer. You've got to compete with the, char with the discharge, charge efficiency, round trip efficiency for the battery. It has to compete with uh, pumped hydro, for example, which might be 75%. So that means that you have to really keep this layer very thin, measured in millimeters. Two, three, four, five, six, I don't know. Millimeters. millimeters. Right, so very thin layer. So that's interesting, because if I drive a lot of flow in the, bithy in the bismuth, and I've got a very thin electrolyte layer above, I might destabilize it. <laughs> you had to ask your first question, didn't you? <laughs> What's the other thing? We'll come to that. <laughs> okay. So this is, this is a, a tin can. So it's, it's steel at the sides. The electrical conductivity of this and this are all are similar. This method, yes. So the current's coming straight, so coming straight well, because it wants to get back up here. So it's, making, it's just taking the path of least resistance. So that's an important point. Very, very little of the current's passing through the bottom of the battery for the particular benchmark case that we have. Okay. So uh, to keep life simple, I'll, make, I'll, s I'll take a cylindrical battery. That's probably not realistic, but you can do something with a cylinder. Um, and although the model, which I'll show you, is completely general, barring boundary conditions, um, for any sort of aspect ratio, it's useful to have a benchmark case just to get orders of magnitude so you can get some sense of what the numbers are. So here's our benchmark case. We'll take a radius of 10 centimeters and a depth of the bismuth of four centimeters. So quite a small, compact device. The electrolyte may be five millimeters thick. Actually, we made it one centimeter if we could draw this thick. Um, we'll take the current passing through the cell to be about 100 amps. I think that's not unreasonable. And uh, from that, we can work out what the voltage drop across the business is from this expression here, which just says essentially the current is some number times the conductivity of the bismuth, the voltage drop across the bismuth times the lateral dimension of the cell. Okay, so that's the benchmark case, which I'll sort of come back to just to kind of keep remind you of orders of magnitude effects. So the model will come to two bits. Uh, you have to think about how the current goes through the cell. You have to model that first. Once you know that, you can get the force distribution. You can get the net current through the cell in terms of voltage. And you can get the to electromagnetic torque. Once you've got the torque, you can then do the fluid mechanics and get the velocity distribution using some rather classical ideas from um, geophysics. Okay, so the, the force distribution bit's easy. We do a cylindrical cell, very simple boundary conditions because the conductivity here and here are the same. In this particular case, some current is sort of dipping into the bottom. So I lied slightly. Um, the point is you can get an exact solution for the current distribution in terms of a Fourier Bessel expansion. Once you've got that, you can get the net current through the cell. That's the expression I showed you earlier. This is just geometry. Um, for the particular benchmark case, that's this thing here is 3.95, and then that's conductivity, voltage drop, and, and lateral dimension. This is the force distribution. This is what the torque looks like. This, again, is just geometry. The key thing is just this expression here, that the torque scales as conductivity, voltage drop, external magnetic field, and lateral dimension cubed. The net torque is important because the, the dominant dynamics here is you're applying a given torque to the pool. And that torque is balanced by the friction top and bottom. Frictional torque in the boundary layers. And the frictional torque in the boundary layers is completely dominated by essentially the outer regions near the cylindrical boundary because that's where the slip velocity is highest and where the lever arm is highest. So the viscous torque is dominated by the peak velocities here and here. And you know what the net torque is. So effectively, the net torque you're applying controls the maximum velocity in the system. Everything, nothing else matters. And I'll show you examples of that in, in a moment. Turns out, also, if you think about it for long enough, in terms of maximum stresses, you can write the net torque exerted on the, the fluid, the bismuth, as just simply the stray magnetic field times the integral across the surface of the current distribution. So again, that's interesting. It's saying that the peak velocity in the battery is simply controlled by the current up here and BZ. Nothing else matters at all. 
Okay, I'll come back with the, the network. So that's the electromagnetics. Here's the fluid mechanics. So um, those of you from a sort of geophysical background will see all this will seem familiar. Those who are not, um, you might be slightly bewildered, but do stop me. Okay, so here's the business that's going to swirl because we're driving it in this direction. We immediately get Ekman layers top and bottom. Ekman layers detrain from the Ekman layer into the bulk. So that drives a secondary flow, here it is, U sec in the RZ plane, and it's got a typical distribution like, like this. So the primary motion is this, then we get a secondary motion like that. It's not symmetric about mid plane because of the force distribution, it's not symmetric. Um, we also get Stewartson layers here and here at the outer boundary. They're in some sense uninteresting because they're thick and therefore dynamically not very important, but they're really unstable. And so we would expect that this system's going to unstable first, not down here in the, in the Bordwart layers or Ekman layers, but at the lateral boundaries where you've got a negative gradient in angular momentum. And that's exactly what, you'll see that in a minute, that's exactly what happens. The flow in the cell goes unstable with really quite weak magnetic field, half a gas, the Earth's magnetic field. And it takes the form of toroidal tail of vortices migrating up and down the, up and down the boundary. Okay, so here's the... So that's schematically what the flow is. Uh, this is just repeating what I said before. The, the dominant balance is really important from an engineering point of view. is applied torque balanced by friction. Friction is just controlled by the peak azimuthal velocity near the outer boundary. So the net torque fixes the maximum velocity. Okay, for detailed modeling, for the detailed distribution of flow here, we just write down these standard equations for swirling recirculating flow. You either know them or you don't. Um, but they happen to look like this. So there's one controlling the primary motion, that's just an angular momentum balance. U dot grad gamma is the angular momentum density by the vertical axis. And this is a rate of change of angular momentum in a fluid parcel, and it's just controlled by the applied Lorentz torque, which is what this is. Then we have to write down the equation for the secondary flow, and the easiest thing to do is just write down the azimuthal vorticity equation don't know it, you don't know it, but it happens to look like this. The rate of change of azimuthal vorticity is d by dz of my angular momentum squared divided by r to the fourth. So this azimuthal vorticity is the vorticity associated with the, the motion in the RZ plane, the, second, the weak secondary flow. So we've got secondary flow here, secondary flow here, balancing this, but we know that with Ekman pumping, the secondary flow is extremely weak because it scales the square root of the viscosity. So the secondary flow is extremely weak. Uz in this system is very weak. So that's weak, that's weak. So the product of the two is very weak. So it tells me immediately that there's no axial gradient in angular momentum. So the angular momentum is pure in the core, this is in the inviscid core, the angular momentum is purely a function of radius. It's entirely independent of Z. So the geophysicists would call that sort of quasi-geocracy. So we take this, we plug it back into our angular momentum equation, and we get a very simple ODE, the radial velocity times the radial gradient in angular momentum density. Subscript C stands for core flow. It's just my applied torque. I'm almost done, not quite. And I have a problem because I've got to, I've got to finesse away this radial velocity, which appears here, but I do that using mass conservation and the detrainment from the Ekman layers, which I know about, or which many of you know about. Okay, so as a prior use of using mass conservation, I'm going to take this equation that applies at any point in here, and I'm going to integrate it vertically up. And so this is the integral of ur from the top of this Ekman layer to the bottom of that Ekman layer. So I'm integrating up uh, a cylinder at fixed radius. And that's the mass, that then becomes the volumetric flow rate as with my cylinder of fixed radius. Multiply my same d gamma dr, and here's my applied torque. But because I've integrated this through the depth, this is an important point, what I get after integration is just the depth averaged force distribution. Not the force distribution, which is a function of r and z, but the depth averaged force distribution. So that tells me that the flow is completely insensitive to the variations in Lorentz forces height, which is controlled by the flow of the current. 
and only cares about or only knows about the debt averaged case. Okay, well, we're almost there. And then <laughs> I'll show you some pretty pictures. So we have to finish the closed system. So that's the equation I showed you a moment ago, which is simply angular momentum balance, applied torque, reaction to applied torque. I multiply by 2 pi r. So when I multiply by 2 pi r, this term is just the mass flux out of a cylinder radius r. Conservation of mass says that must be balanced by whatever mass I'm pumping in, up from here, and down from the top board mark layer. So this is the mass flux at the radial side of my cylindrical column of radius r. This is the mass that's coming in from the top and the bottom, two here, because I've got two boundary layers pushing mass in. So I can write ur, or this integral of ur, in terms of ub, UB the b sounds for boundary, so it's a, that's essentially the rate of detrainment of velocity from the Eckman layer. And then there's a miracle. I know what ub is, or at least I know what, <laughs> I know what ub is for an ideal Birdwart layer, so an ideal, or ideal Eckman layer. An ideal Eckman layer is an Eckman layer on an infinite cylinder, infinite disk, and with rigid body rotation above that infinite disk. And in that situation, I know that ub is 1.35, just a number, root mu times gamma c. And then take a deep breath and say, well, let's, um, let's suppose this also worked for a non-ideal Ekman layer, finite radius, not exactly a rigid body rotation. And I'm finished. I replace UB in here by this in terms of gamma, take this up to here, and here's my governing equation. And I'm done. So I've got a single, very simple ODE for the angular momentum distribution in the battery. Um, no adjustable coefficients, because I've there is a coefficient here, but I've fixed it sort of in an honest way, as it were, through looking at it, the ideal board work layer, Ekman layer. All right, so that's all there is to it. You can extract quite a lot of information from this without doing any work. The first thing is, I've said this already, the angular momentum is a function only of the depth added force. So it's very insensitive to the route of the current through the liquid metal. All it cares about is the force exerted through. If you do a little bit of work in this, you can show that the maximum velocity at the edge of the Stewartson layer scales as the net torque divided by this lot here, that's viscosity, radius, density, should be two thirds. Um, but the net torque proportional to the BZ or B naught, the external magnetic field. So that gives me the scaling law that the maximum velocity in the battery scales as B to two thirds. And the third thing I can do is I can go back, I said this already that if you think in terms of Maxwell stresses, um, you can actually write the net torque in terms simply of the B naught, the, the imposed magnetic field, and the current flow coming in through the top. And when I do that, and, and I can rewrite the right-hand side here, I get the same left-hand side, but I can rewrite this as applied magnetic field, current flowing into the top, so I top of R is the current that flows in through a circle of radius r into the top of the bismuth with viscosity down here. So that's again emphasizing that the flow in the battery is just controlled by this and this. It doesn't care about anything else. Okay, so that's the model. It's laminar, but it actually works, as we'll see in a second, it works for unsteady laminar flow when it goes really unsteady, unstable in the struts and layers. It also works pretty well when the flow is weakly turbulent. Actually, it works not too badly when it's strongly turbulent, but the, you can see differences. Okay, so let's look at the numerical simulations. This, these are done in open foam again. It seems to be the, the favored computational tool for liquid metal batteries. It seems everyone's using it. Um, so this is u theta at different radii as a function of depth in the bismuth. This is in the core. This is a radius of... Uh, 0.78 times capital R. So this is the core flow, and you can see it is indeed the flow is independent of height z, as the theory suggests. Once you get into the Stewartson layers at the side, then you do see some vertical dependence, as you should. But in the bulk, it's z independent. This is um, the variation again for half a gauss, so the Earth's magnetic field, the minimum magnetic field that you'd expect. Um, so this is u theta as a function of r. 
and there's a whole bunch of curves here. The, the theory I've just shown you is the green dashed line. Uh, the red line is the flow you get from the numerical simulation when you just encode the depth average force. The blue line is the flow you get when you put the actual force distribution, which is very Z dependent. And they just sit exactly on top. The blue and the blue and the red sit almost exactly on top of each other, which confirms that the flow doesn't care about actual variations in forcing. And both these curves are fairly close to the theory. But <laughs> my favorite curve is this one. So we deliberately put a force in which looks nothing like the actual force distribution, completely different. But we chose it so it gave the net, the right net global torque. And I said earlier that the only thing that the, ma the maximum velocity really cares about, I claimed, was the global torque. And that's exactly right. You see that th this is way off um, the theory and the, and the actual force distribution curves down here, but you still get the same maximum velocity in the battery. So if all you're interested in is the maximum velocity, all you have to know about is the net torque. And the net torque is just the BZ and the current in the top of the business. Okay, the theory for laminar flow, but actually it's <laughs> and steady flow. This is not steady. It's actually laminar at half a gas, it's um, laminar and unsteady, and, and it's a classic every chemical engineer knows this. So it's a classic flow you get when you force some swirl in a in a in a cylinder. So this, these are vertical sections at different times. This is the secondary flow in the RZ plane driven by the Ekman pumping. And what you get, of course, are that it's really unstable here, here. And you get these toroidal vortices that just migrate, this is very typical, they just migrate up and down the outer boundary, rather benignly. That's the seeds of turbulence. Um, it's not axiosymmetric if you do a sort of plan view, cut through the cell and look from above, what you actually find is it's an N equals four uh, node. So that's half a gas, that's the magnetic field in this room. Well, maybe more or less. So let's go up. So that's absolutely tiny. So let's crank up the magnetic field a bit. This field switch is still actually tiny, much, much weaker than a fridge magnet. Um, so this is the one I've talked about. That's at five, half a gas. That's unsteady but laminar. By the time I get to one gas, I'll show you in this moment, then you get weak turbulence. It's chaotic but not broadband. And I get up to the absolutely massive field of three times the Earth's magnetic field, one and a half gas, nothing. And it's broadband turbulence, it's fully turbulent. So of course, unless you haven't picked up already, the main message is here, these flows are frighteningly sensitive to stray magnetic fields. Um, interestingly, we got lucky. So the laminar model still works quite well when the flows are weakly turbulent. So this is a weakly turbulent case. This is Vnox one gas. Theory is the, the, the green dashed line, and these are all very depth average, not depth average simulations, of, you know, a variety of simulations. Essentially, everything matches this absolutely fine, like it did the previous case. So we know what the flow looks like. So the main message here is it goes from unsteady, we had a tiny, tiny magnetic field, to weakly turbulent at a tiny magnetic field, to fully turbulent at a slightly larger than tiny magnetic field. And the model seems to hold quite well in, in all cases. Um, just to sort of finish off the, uh, so this is summarizing the effective increase in BZ. This is half a gas. This is the velocity uh, as a function of time at different radial positions. This is in the core away from the edges. This is getting into the Stewartson layers. That's at half a gas. And you can see that there's a lot of fluctuations. It's not turbulent, but it's lots of fluctuations at half a gas, but only in the outer Stewartson layers, not in the bulk. This is at one gas. Um, now we've got some turbulence, weak turbulence. It's not broadband, um, but definitely turbulence. It's clearly chaotic, but only only in the outer regions, only in the Stuarts and layers. So it's fairly quiescent in, in the bulk. How many does the time? Where's Pinky Chairman? All of them. How, how much time have I got left? I've got enough time for two more slides. Okay. All right. So. So this extreme sensitivity of liquid metal pools to stray vertical magnetic fields might come as a surprise. It's actually extremely well known in the metal processing industry. It's a very common phenomenon. It's seen in many industrial processes. So 
It's been an argument in reduction cells of the sort that Don showed in Quebec. I've been to that smelter, by the way. Um, the case where it's most commonly, um, most probably most famous, is in a process called vacuum arc remelting. So if you want to, uh, uh, most critical components in an aircraft are made from um, deuterium or nickel-based superalloys. And when you first cast it, they're so hot. I'm watching you here. They're so hot when you first cast it, they d it just eats up everything you cast it in. It gobbles up the ceramic material. So the first thing that you get is full of crud. And Rolls-Royce don't like making their turbine blades out of stuff that's full of crud. So they, the first thing they do when you've got an ingot made of deuterium or, or nickel is you take it and then you, you sort of produce a process like um, electric arc welding. You put a massive great current down through the pre-ingot. You melt the bottom off here. You get little droplets of stuff coming down through the arc. And this is water cooled. And you form a little pool here. And you form a second ingot below, which is purified because you've burnt off all the impurities, which have then been sucked off in the vacuum system. So anything in an aircraft has been through, I think, has been through this process more or less. Um, and they've known for an incredibly long time. So if you're, if you're in the business of making vacuum arc remelting equipment, your biggest nightmare is getting rid of VZ. The tiniest vertical magnetic, stray vertical magnetic field produces very intense swirling motion in the liquid metal pool. That changes the temperature distribution, and it turns out the temperature distribution you get, if it's strongly swirling, is adverse to the crystalline structure that you'd like. So the people making this equipment go really bend over backwards to um, get rid of their BZ. So they're really, really careful about the way they put current in and back out of vacuum arc remelting. And there's many industri other industrial processes where tiny, tiny BZ is produced disproportionately, apparently disproportionately large horizontal motions. Reduction cells is another example. Okay, back to batteries, then I'm finished. Um, why do we care about this? So a typical battery might have uh, 100 amps running down through it. Now a single connector with 100 amps produces a field at 10 centimeters of about two grams. Already that's way into the fully turbulent regime. And that's just one battery with one connecting wire going through it. Now imagine we've got 200, 300 batteries and we cluster them all into a cluster to get the power density up to a reasonable level. Every single battery in the cluster is now connected. They're all producing magnetic field. And the current passing through all the batteries is producing magnetic field. So it seems extremely likely that in a cluster you're going to get magnetic fields significantly in excess of 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 10 gas, 5 gas. So what that, now in some sense, and Frank alluded to this, in some sense that's sort of, <laughs> it's good because you want some mixing of the layers, you want to keep the layers reasonably mixed. But remember the electrolyte is by design really very thin. If you, get a, if you let it get larger than say five millimeters, your round trip charge discharge efficiency is not competitive with pumped hydro anymore. So it's very thin, it's thin, would be thinner. And you're driving these large turbulent swirling flows. And so the natural concern of course is that you could disrupt the integrity of the electrolyte there. And so what that tells me as an engineer is that you have to think really, really carefully about how you interconnect these batteries in a cluster. It could make a huge difference whether you have them in parallel, in series, and so on. Now, I'm okay for time? I'll stop there, I think. Okay, thank you. Questions? Go on, Rich, go for it. Have you? Well done. It's not very big. It could be. It's, but it's really the, it's the Ekman number in the, in the Richardson layers, that, the, in the Stewartson layers that, that really matter. Because you're, you're way below the critical value for them. It's his battery, not my battery. <laughs> so my, my sense is, but I, I should ask Don, my sense is this is a very highly constrained problem. I mean, you think about the discussion from him and Norbert about the, the seals. Just the, I lost my stick. I think you hinted that you spend an enormous amount of time just fixing this. 
this is a highly, highly constrained problem. You have to get the electrical design right. You have to get the efficiency right. You have to get the fluid mechanics right. You have to get the thermal design right because you want these things to stay at 500 degrees plus or minus a bit. And you're getting that, as you pointed out, from the mostly from the ohmic heating of the electrolyte, but you don't want that heating to be too large, otherwise you're out of business. Your efficiency isn't high enough. So the, this is a highly, highly constrained system. It's just like ion reduction cells. Anyone who's worked in the electrolysis of aluminium, it's the same thing. Uh, the smelter that Don showed, they operate wonderfully smoothly. You walk into a smelter, you get hit over by the heat because of all the ohmic heating of the electrolyte, but it's very quiescent. You just get all these, these electric cells sitting there just humming gently and everything seems fine. But it took the aluminum industry a phenomenal amount of time to get there in terms of thermal design, aspect ratio, flow of current, electrical connections between individuals, reduction cells and so forth. It's a massive task. And uh, there's famous stories of smelters where some <laughs> someone has changed just one buzz bar on the cell at one end of the, of the smelter and the cell at the other end of the smelter, which is two football pitches away, goes unstable. <laughs> so these are very, very, very sensitive systems. I actually take my hat off to the fact that you managed to make so much progress with something that's so compli complicated from an engineering point of view here. So y you don't have to think Frax sort of is tongue in the cheek slightly with, with sort of taking liberties with dimensions and things, but I think in practice, it, it's, a, it's a very constrained system if you want it to work. So So if it were me, I would just be thinking, I get my, I'd hire myself an extremely good electrical engineer and just think about how you're routing the current through the clusters. I, I, a, a turbulent flow is probably, just a, a mild turbulent flow is probably good for mixing. And do I get, here's Milbert. Uh -huh. So a mild turbulent flow would, is probably quite good for, for mixing in, in the battery, I think. Um, it's, it's when that interface starts to come out that you're in trouble. And there is a poster, um, Fedor, um, who's one of my undergraduate student, project students, um, was looking at movement of the interface, and there's a poster outside which shows you how the interface can move when the turbulence levels get, get too high. So, so it is a key kind of thing. Peter, sorry for the very low-level question, but are you at liberty to make the containment device um, have a much higher conductivity? So could you make it out of copper and then, um, I mean, I mean, much more of the current would actually be vertical as opposed to radial. Uh, right, so that's why I kept emphasizing all that matters is the net torque. And all the not net torque cares about is a DZ, which you can't control unless you get a good electrical engineer and the current you're passing down through the cells, which is sometimes you can't control either. Okay, I don't all right. I think you're anywhere close to answering it. <laughs> okay, so let me go to this picture and then you can well, ask again. Just to say you can't control. I mean, your cartoon, there, I want to modify your cartoon so that much more of the current actually is vertical and much less of it is radial. That's yes. what I'm trying to achieve. That's right. And so you can't say that you can't do anything. No, no, okay. So if you accept this as a sort of cartoon and you could try and force it to be more vertical and so forth, or you could take it out the bottom, that's right. And then take it, if you can take it out the bottom and up the sides, that would be perfect if you have, if you have the freedom to do that. So I agree with that. But would you want to make it out of copper? <laughs> Depends if the uh, bottom metal is hard enough. Yep. <coughs> it has to, um, but Andy, it has to get down to the bottom first. Once it gets to the copper at the bottom, it's fine, it will shunt around. But you have to get it to the bottom to shunt around before it does that. So you, you'd have to raise the level of the, you'd have to reduce the depth of the bismuth. Which would affect. Question, thank you. Um, curiously, if you go to a very strong magnetic field rather than yes. a stray, weak magnetic field, 
<coughs> then you would stabilize the whole thing. The current would go down straight parallel to the magnetic field and hit the bottom, which is what you want. If you put a very strong magnetic field in, you would be... Sorry, a magnetic field. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, a strong magnetic BZ. field, a large Hartman number. Why not? Apart from the expense, of course. <laughs> I, well, I don't, I don't think I would choose to do that. <laughs> I mean, there'd be a whole lot of consequences of putting a very large field in. I think that's not realistic. Okay, um, I think we are about uh, at the okay. time we can allow, so I suggest we move on to the next talk. So thanks to again, Peter. <laughs> so the next talk is by uh, Douglas Kelly from the University of Rochester, and he's going to talk about dynamics and stability of flow structures in liquid metal batteries. All right, uh, is the audio okay? Great. Uh, I'm Doug, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I want to thank the organizers for putting this together. I'm sure it must have been a lot of work, but uh, I, don't, I don't anymore take it for granted when we have opportunities to get together and talk science and share ideas. After two years of being out of it, uh, uh, the value